Good morning. Good morning. Oh, okay, you're there. Couldn't quite see you. My name is Marcus Clausley, and I teach. Thank you. That's nice. Thank you. And I teach New Testament and Greek together with Dr. Croto in the seminary. And unfortunately, my own wife and CIU sweetheart of 20 years couldn't be with me this morning. Uh, we have a sick child, and so she couldn't be here today. But she's around on campus sometime. So, and she's the most beautiful woman in the world, so you, <laughs> she'll stand out. My task today is to help us continue to think together about how we should respond to challenges to evangelical unity. And I mean, honestly, today's going to sound a bit more like a lecture than a sermon. And as I get into the topic, I think you'll see that. I will try to keep it as interesting as possible. But just the way it's set up is going to be more that way. So work with me, think along with me, and uh, how we can respond to these challenges that face how we relate to ideas that might challenge our own thinking, but are still within the bounds of orthodoxy. Yesterday, Dr. Crodo reminded us that preserving unity has two parts. First, we have to be sure we know what it means to be evangelical. And Dr. Crodo gave us a great definition from Bebbington to help us out on that. And second, it involves understanding which doctrines we need to agree on with others in order to remain evangelical, and which are doctrines over which good Christians can just disagree. Dr. Croto helped us out there with some ideas on how to do what he called theological triage, namely assessing which issues should be considered first order and second order, and so on. My task today is to move from the general evangelicalism to the specific and focus on one area of Christian theology where there has been quite a bit of recent debate over whether it even should fall in the area of evangelicalism. The area is called the new perspective on Paul. And along with this, along with examining this particular idea, I also want to look at some views of its most prolific and, as some will argue, most evangelical proponent, Dr. N.T. Wright. This is a huge topic, and we have a half an hour. So we're going to have to just focus on some essentials. And so I'm just going to give you a crash course if you haven't been exposed to it already, a crash course in what is meant by the new perspective on Paul. And then I'm going to lay out some areas of doctrine that it impacts, that it affects, and those specifically formulated by Dr. Wright. And finally, and hopefully productively, I want to take a bit of time to interact with some of these aspects that have proved challenging for evangelicals to deal with. Now, as we progress, and as I've already warned you that it's more of a lecture than a sermon, you might wonder why we are spending time on this seemingly heady topic. And that's a good question. And my answer are two words, trickle down. In other words, what is discussed in the theological academy will at some point arrive in the pulpit. And the new perspective of, on Paul made its debut about 40 years ago or so. And that's enough time for trickle-down to have already taken place. Another reason is N.T. Wright himself. Wright is probably one of the most prolific theological authors of our time and possibly of all time. He's written, according to one source, over 70 books. And while some of his books are rather long and complex, a recent book of his on Paul and his theology weighs in at about 1,700 pages. That's a great one for your semester reading. He has also written countless commentaries, Bible studies, 
and a whole bunch of just popular works, things that are really fun to read. And he's a great writer and communicator and speaker. One of these is an updated version of C.S. Lewis's spiritual classic, Mere Christianity, entitled Simply Christian. If you've not been exposed formally to N.T. Wright, you've most certainly been exposed informally. And it's just worth time taking. Uh, it's worth, this is worth take, uh, taking time to consider how to engage him and his ideas, especially in the spirit of evangelical unity, what we're talking about this week. So let's begin with a brief overview of the new perspective on Paul. But first, a couple of ideas or thoughts on the word perspective. Last year around daylight savings time, someone sent me, uh, posted a joke on my Facebook page, and it went something like this. What comes after the closing song at church? Scroll down. People who forgot to set their clocks forward. <laughs> Laughter. Um, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but you can certainly imagine the feeling. You wake up on a Sunday morning and look at your clock and think, plenty of time. You get out of bed slowly, take a shower, get dressed, go down to breakfast, maybe even have a second cup of coffee. You look again at the clock and think, I'm just going to leave early today, so I have time to talk with friends before the service starts. And off you go. You don't even drive over the speed limit. You're just, you're just on your way to church, and it's just a beautiful Sunday morning. And then you arrive and realize that people aren't streaming into the church, but out of it. What's wrong? Are you wrong, or are they wrong? Well. It depends on their perspective. It depends on your perspective. From your perspective, you are perfectly on time. You haven't missed a beat. From their perspective, people who have embraced the new reality of the time change, you are hopelessly late. When we talk about the new perspective on Paul, we're discussing a major shift in what some are convinced is the new and correct way to understand the writings of the Apostle Paul. For those who, figuratively speaking, have now set their clocks forward to this new perspective, comes the conviction that they have found the key to understand what Paul was really saying. In fact, that's a title of one of the books, What St. Paul Really Said, according to this perspective. But for those who refuse, or forget, to change, they will, as far as the others are concerned, just continue to be late, or to put it theologically, interpret Paul wrong, because they've just refused to embrace the new reality. So, what is the new perspective, and how is it related to the old perspective it claims to replace? What is now known as the old perspective was at one time new. And since its earliest proponent was none other than Martin Luther, it's sometimes called the Lutheran view. And I think the best way and simplest way to illustrate it is to look at one passage of scripture from the perspective, first from the perspective of the old perspective or the Lutheran view, and then to take a look at that same passage through the lens of N.T. Wright, a proponent of the new perspective. I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. So if you have your Bibles or phones or some kind of device, uh, scrolls are fine too. Um, thank you for laughing. Uh, open your Bibles to Galatians 2, 15 and 16. Galatians 2, 15 and 16. And as you read, pay attention to the words justified by works of the law, because I'm going to have, give you an assignment in just one second. So pay attention to the words justified by the works of the law. I'm going to read now from the ESV. We ourselves, Paul writes, are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, 
no one will be justified. Thanks be to God for his word. So, with the person next to you, take one minute, take one minute and discuss what you understood when you heard the word not justified by works of law. What does that mean? Don't go too deep theological, just what does that mean in the text? Take one minute with the person next to you. Go. Ten seconds. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to all stand and share your results. But if you understood not justified by works of the law as meaning that Paul was combating people who were using the law to earn their way into heaven, or to earn God's favor, or earn salvation, if that's how you understood, not justified by works of the law, then you're in great company. Because that's how Martin Luther understood it. He, yeah. <laughs> he understood that this is a polemic, this is a fight against people who misunderstand the gospel. The gospel isn't about doing a bunch of stuff to make God happy with you so that you get to heaven. Luther understood Paul here from his perspective on Paul and what's going on in this passage. He understood it, that Paul is countering that. He's teaching what is necessary and the only thing that is necessary as given by the apostle is faith in Christ alone. The only thing that you must have is faith in Christ alone. It is through that faith in his atoning death and resurrection that forgiveness of sins is possible. And listen to this carefully, because this is Luther's big one. Okay? And I'm getting this right from him. He comments on this passage. Okay? Luther says that you're justified, you're declared innocent in God's court, and Christ's righteousness is given to you to enable for you to stand before him without fault and blemish. You're saved, in other words. You're completely saved. It's not, you haven't, you haven't experienced it yet. But the moment of justification, you're declared innocent, and then you're given Christ's righteousness. It's imputed to you. That's a word you might have heard in your systematic class, okay? It's imputed to you. It's given to you. And it's from this new state of someone who has been given Christ's righteousness that you now do the things that match this new life. You do good works on that basis. And you, as Luther puts it, endure difficulties. Okay? That's the old perspective or the Lutheran perspective on this super important passage in Galatians. And if any, anything of what I said sounds familiar, it's because most of you, or probably all of you, are in some sense um, familiar with this old perspective, whether you knew to call it that or not. And this is, and I hope you agree, full of glorious truths of what God does. But there's a problem, and there always is. 
in the centuries that followed the Reformation, not everybody was convinced that Luther got it right here. And what bothered them is it seemed that Luther was equating how he understood Paul's fight with the Jews of his day with his own fight against the Roman church of the Middle Ages. The Roman church of the Middle Ages that Luther knew said that you were not saved by God imputing his righteousness to you, but rather that you had to do a whole bunch of good works to gain God's favor, favor to get a certain amount of merits, and then you could, be, you could stand before God at the judgment. That's what the church taught. And Luther looked at Galatians and other passages, especially in Paul, and he looked at the church and he made a one-to-one -one correspondence. Paul's fighting against legalism and using the law to get saved. The Roman church is teaching the same thing. I'm going with Paul. Faith alone, in Christ alone, as, it's, as it says in the word alone. That's the analogy Luther made. And over the centuries, people said, I'm not sure that was really fair to compare the Roman church of the Middle Ages to the Jews of Paul de Paul's day. I'm not sure that Luther handled the backgrounds there correctly. Probably was some New Testament professor who used the word backgrounds. And indeed it was. Um, in 1977, a professor, author, scholar named E.P. Sanders, not Colonel Sanders, E.P. Sanders, published his seminal work on this topic called, it's a riveting title, hold on to your seats, Paul and Palestinian Judaism. Wow, that's a great title. <laughs> okay, in this very long book, Sanders, and a very important book, by the way, Paul or Sanders reevaluated all the Jewish writings of the first, what we call the Second Temple period, the period around the time of Christ, okay, after the rebuilding of the temple, after the exile, up till its destruction, that what we call the Second Temple period. And he, he evaluated all the Jewish writings and how Jews thought about their own religion, and he came to the conclusion that a new understanding of Judaism was necessary. And he called this idea covenantal gnomism. Okay, gnomism having to do with the law. Okay, your, your relation to the law on the basis of the covenant. According to this covenantal gnomism, Judaism, and catch this, this is really important, Judaism was essentially a religion of grace and not works. Did you hear me? It wasn't a religion of works. Rather, according to Sanders' findings and others around the same time, Judaism was not a religion of works, but of grace. Well, how does he get there? Well, according to Sanders, the Jews of Paul's day did not believe they needed to do any works to get into a covenant relationship with God. That was granted by God's grace when they were brought into the community by circumcision or whatever rites they used. That was all God's grace. They didn't do anything. They didn't deserve it. They were just put in. And works were the appropriate response to what God did in his grace. As someone kind of summarized it, works were not the thing to get in. They were the thing to stay in. See the difference? Okay, Luther says the Jews of Paul's day are using works to gain God's favor. They're doing the law so they can get God to like them. Sanders comes along and others and says, whoa, 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 whoa. that's not the Judaism of Paul's day at all. They actually believed in grace. They weren't trying to get in, they were in, they knew it. And so they were just doing works because they were grateful to God and wanted to stay in fellowship with him. So let's go to Paul for a second. In this new perspective, if we read Paul from this new perspective, Paul's debate then was not against Jews using works of the law to be saved. Instead, he was fighting against Jewish Christians 
who were using the requirements of the law as a means of keeping Gentiles out. That's really possible. Think back to the book of Acts, chapter 15. If you remember, Paul and Barnabas had just returned from doing mission work among the Gentiles, and they come back, and a group of Jewish Christians, okay, from the Pharisee party, but who had become Christians, who had believed on Jesus as Messiah, they come and accuse Paul and say, that's not how salvation works. Gentiles first have to become Jews before they can become Christians. That is, they have, to be, they have to be circumcised if they're males. They have to be brought into the covenant. They have to keep the law of Moses. And then they can, they can receive the benefits of the Messiah. And so what Paul was really fighting against wasn't work salvation, like Luther saw in the Roman church of his day. Rather, he was fighting against Jewish Christians who were saying, who didn't want Gentiles to crash their party. They didn't want Gentiles to become Christians. And Paul's really mad about it because he's just spent all this time evangelizing Gentiles and taught them that they can just receive Christ by faith. Why are we excluding them by using the law, by using works of the law, by telling them they need to be circumcised and keep the law and so on and so on? Paul's really mad. And in fact, if you read the book of Galatians, he is really mad at what's going on in that particular, at the people he's writing to. He's, 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 he's just furious that they would do that. Okay? Now, do you see the difference? Okay? Do you see the difference? If you hold to this new perspective, or to what's called the new perspective... And if Judaism is actually a religion of grace and not of works righteousness, as supposed by Luther, and if the real problem was that the law was used to exclude others and not to gain God's favor, then it stands to reason that Paul's understanding of the gospel, especially as explained by Luther and the reformers, would need a massive overhaul. The perspective on Paul changes a lot. The new perspective on Paul could potentially change a lot. Now, the one thing about the new perspective is it's not just like this thing, like a building somewhere, new perspective building, and people go there who, who agree to it. It's, it's kind of a movement, and there's lots of different opinions. But one of its best and most, as we said before, one of its most eloquent spokesman, someone who holds to this very dearly and, and tries to work out its implications for how we understand the scriptures, is N.T. Wright. Now, before we proceed, it's important to just say a few things about this British scholar and churchman. Though not viewed without controversy in evangelical circles, Wright is also greatly admired for how he has used his, both his positions as a scholar and as, bishop, as a bishop in the Church of England for defending the truth of Scripture. In his book, Debating N.T. Wright's View on Justification, no less than John Piper says about him, I'm thankful for Wright's strong commitment to Scripture as his final authority, his defense and celebration of the resurrection of the Son of God, his vindication of the deity of Christ, his belief in the virgin birth of Jesus, his biblical disapproval of homosexual conduct, and the consistent way he presses us to see the big picture of God's universal purpose for all people's missions through the covenant with Abraham and more. Further, in a description that would warm Dr. Crutchfield's heart, another author comments on Wright. Wright is concerned that we do not allow traditions, however honorable, to color or even distort our reading of the biblical texts themselves. In other words, Wright is extremely committed to interpreting scripture completely in its own context historical, literary, theological. He's very, very careful 
That, that's, the, that's the level of engagement with the text in a way that you can understand what the author, and in this case, Paul, is saying. <sighs> okay, decompress for a second. And that was just my aside. Okay. Right, just from the few things I mentioned, sounds pretty evangelical. In fact, pretty much everything he stands for is evangelical, okay? And when you hear him speak and read his books, there is, you, you just have to go, wow. I mean, in his commitment to what we sang about, the cross of Christ and all those things, he is completely committed to those. But what's difficult is because he holds to the new perspective, he says some things in, a, in ways that are, that sound like he's leaving something out, that sound like he has, he's missed something. But that, of course, is because he holds to a different perspective on how to understand Paul. And I say this because it might be tempting when Wright says something that we, we don't quite hear everything we want to hear, we can just dismiss him and say, uh, yeah, yeah, he's probably right is wrong, okay, in that sense. Thank you for laughing. And, um, and it just doesn't square with what I believe. But really, when you consider everything else, we owe him a fair hearing. We owe him a fair hearing. We owe it to try to understand him. So let's get a taste for how Wright applies the new perspective on Paul by looking at the same passage from Galatians that we looked at earlier from Martin Luther. And I'm just going to look at a couple things. I'm not, there's a lot more we can do here. Just going to look at a couple things. And this, by the way, if you want to read further, is in his book, Justification, okay, uh, from 2009. Very interesting book to read. But uh, here's the passage again. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have also believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one is justified. So how does someone from the new perspective read this? In sharp contrast to Luther, Wright does not believe that Paul is arguing against people who believe that by doing good deeds, they'll be saved from their sins. Instead, he argues that the works of the law here are not, and here are his own words, the moral good works which the Reformation tradition loves to hate. They are the things that divide Jew from Gentile, specifically in the context of this passage, not eating with Gentiles. And that's what's going on, okay? Paul has just had a big argument with Peter who withdrew from table fellowship with Gentiles because, of, because he felt pressure not to do that. Now listen to what Wright does. Thus, Wright concludes that to be justified here means essentially, I'm going to use his words, to be reckoned by God to be a true member of his family and hence with the right to share in table fellowship. Wait, but what about forgiveness of sins and all that stuff? Well, yeah, that's kind of in the background. But justified here, according to Wright, means really nothing more than God saying, everybody belongs to my family, and therefore they should be able to eat together in fellowship at the table. Okay, extreme exegetical reading of this passage, not far from the context. In fact, Wright argues, and he goes on to argue quite strongly, that being justified only applies to a person being declared not guilty by God and has nothing whatsoever to do with the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Wright sees justification as the starting point of the salvation process. It's the first thing that happens. God looks at you who come to him in faith or come to Christ in faith and says, not guilty. Okay, let's move on. Okay, now you're in. Now you've entered in. That's where justification is nothing more than that. There is no imputation of Christ's righteousness. Wright says that, that's, a, that's an idea from the Middle Ages. It's really hard to defend from the Bible. He doesn't hold to that. Hmm. Well... In fact, and this is a great quote, uh, Wright says that to equate justification with what it means to be saved, and these are his words, is like calling the steering wheel of your car the whole car. Justification is just a part. It does something. It's really important. 
but it's not the whole card. There's a lot of other pieces. Wright's not denying you can't be saved. He's just saying we're using this word completely wrong because we've read it in a wrong context. We've read it in the Luther context and not in the new perspective context. Okay, so justified now has an entirely new idea. Okay, the logical question at this point is, if justification only makes one innocent before God and not clothed in Christ's righteousness, okay, imputed righteousness, then how do you get saved at the end? Wright answers this by looking at passages where Paul explains, listen carefully, that believers will be judged by God or by Christ at the final judgment on the basis of their works. And he points to passages like 2 Corinthians 5.10, which read, we must all appear before the Messiah's judgment seat so that we may each receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. So does this mean that a person can't know if they're going to be saved until the last second? No. That's not what Wright believes at all. He believes that when God declares a person justified or innocent, it is a, quote, present verdict which anticipates the verdict issued at the last day. In other words, when God says it here, he's anticipating saying it there. But we really don't know how that's going to happen. The point is that you should be doing works that fit with being declared innocent. Now, that's a pretty, that's a pretty big simplification, but a lot of these are just his own words, okay, in a book that, where he describes his view on just justification. As you might imagine, if Wright and Luther differ so much on just a couple of verses in Galatians, how much more are they going to differ on all other passages found in Paul that deal with the question of works and being justified? They're going to do, differ a lot because, as we said at the beginning, perspective counts. Somebody's looking at one clock, somebody's looking at another clock. Somebody's going to be late. Somebody's going to be late. If works doesn't mean works the way we understand it, if justification doesn't mean what we understand it, and so on, um, where do we go from here? Does this mean that right is not orthodox in his beliefs? In other words, is right right? Uh, it depends whom you ask. While some maintain that right has just given us a new way to understand things, others accuse him of complicating and even obscuring the gospel. So, how should one respond to the discrepancies between the Lutheran view of Paul and the new perspective on Paul, and especially in the results of exegesis and understanding the gospel? Here are just a few thoughts. First and foremost, while the new perspective has certainly helped to broaden our understanding of the Judaism of Paul's day, and reminded us of difficulties that Paul had with Jewish Christians who sought to exclude Gentiles on the basis of following the law, recent research and a number of other scholars who've looked into it have definitely shown that the new perspective on Paul is not a done deal. Okay, Sanders Wright's view on the background of Paul is not a done deal. As one person put it, Sanders' attempt to find a single pattern of religion in first century Judaism sometimes led him to downplay the vast differences between various groups and theological perspectives within Judaism. In other words, Sanders wanted a silver bullet. He wanted a one-size-fits-all of Judaism in the first century. And the fact of the matter is that Judaism was really diverse. There were plenty, admittedly, according to the new perspective, and it's probably true, who viewed salvation as given by God through grace. In other words, God graciously put you in the covenant and you needed works to stay in. No argument there. However, there were sufficient others who were using works in order to gain God's approval. You can demonstrate that from the literature. It's not, a, it's not just a monolith. It's not just one perspective. There are different views there. So we are not bound to do everything according to the new perspective. We have to kind of take things as they come. Second, while Wright's attempt to apply the new perspective on Paul to his exegesis in a consistent way is certainly admirable, 
In other words, he wants to be consistent across the board, completely biblical, to his credit. Um, as someone puts it, he ends up be, being too consistent, okay? And I would add, in the process, tends to muddle the gospel message. As someone once said, Wright is so concerned that we don't lose sight of Paul's big picture and that we don't interpret Paul in terms of individualistic salvation and justification that he seems to be subtly reinterpreting words away from their original meaning. And this is not from someone who's Wright's enemy. This is just an observation. And I think you can see that in certain ways. There are passages that talk about justification in terms of the broader view of salvation. There are passages that talk about imputed righteousness. Okay, Those, that doctrine hasn't gone away. Um, the idea of judgment by works is disputed. But Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it seems, if you take a look at the rest of the New Testament, works are something that follow faith in Christ. They're an appropriate expression of your faith. They demonstrate that you believe, but they aren't the things that you need to be saved. There's time and there's place there for debate. So what should we do in the spirit of evangelical unity? Um, first, we owe new perspective on Paul authors like N.T. Wright a fair hearing so that we can understand them best and, yes, benefit from their insights. There are lots of things to learn from writers like N.T. Wright. On the other hand, new doesn't necessarily mean correct or better, but might be something in need of correction and revision itself. And thus, we should also read opposing voices to explore all sides of an issue. That's just good scholarship. Second, we're obligated to search the scriptures for ourselves so that, we can, so that we can respond in a way that's informed by the text and not just our own opinions. In Acts 17, Paul goes to the church in Berea and tells them the gospel. They've got him standing right there. They can ask him any question they want to. Not like we, where we have to kind of say, okay, which perspective are we going with? He's right there. And Luke says that these Jewish Christians in Berea were more noble than others because they searched the scriptures. Even though they could ask Paul, they said, that's really interesting, Paul. Let's look at it. Let's do our homework. And after all, isn't that why you came to a biblical university? Isn't that why I went into biblical studies? so that I can be equipped, so I can study the scriptures for myself and hopefully lead others in the study of the scriptures so that we can be like the noble Bereans and know what the scriptures say. Wright's done his homework. Have we? Have we done our homework? Finally, I think it's important to keep in mind what Dr. Croto said yesterday about the different levels of theology. We need wisdom from the Holy Spirit to know what, what are the first order issues and what are secondary issues. And in exploring these things, when statements go against first order ideas that are not only in my systematic theology book, but that are, I can demonstrate from scripture and seem in line with, the, with historic Christianity, um, that should give us a yellow flag. We need discernment, how far we can go, and when we have to say, I'm not going past that point. To quote one of the, one of the oldest perspectives on Paul, here in closing, um, 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16, there are something in Paul's letters that are hard to understand. Do I get an amen? Paul is hard to understand, but God gives us his word, his spirit, and his people to help us grow and walk in the truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us the tools to understand it. Thank you for giving us people throughout history who encourage us to read the text in its appropriate context. And thank you most of all for your Holy Spirit and the community of faith.
Please help us, Father, to grow in the truth and help us to grow in unity and keep us from compromise on either side. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.